Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we'd like to uh, welcome everybody here this morning in Jesus' name. Another beautiful sunny day. With We got some answers to prayer this past week with some rain, so that was nice. Um, but I'm just, I'm just glad to be here with you all this morning and thank the Lord that uh, everybody had a safe trip here this morning and that we can be here fellowshipping and worshiping the Lord together. I, I, I always think of this verse, uh, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up into the house of the Lord. So I'm glad everybody can be here with us this morning. And for those of you that are getting live feeds on the computer and, and whatnot, we welcome you as well. Um, just a couple of, no of announcements here. Um, this coming next Sunday, we'll be on the same uh, schedule, 9.30 a.m. worship service. And then uh, Wednesday, July 19th, we have the 7 p.m. Bible study uh, with Pastor Grevin leading uh, via Zoom, the Red Sea Rules number 7. Uh, envision God's enveloping presence. And study guides are available at church on the back desk back there. So, And then... Uh, and then we have Sunday, July 23rd, worship service at 9.30 as well to look forward to. Uh, thank you to all that have sponsored and been so faithful at sponsoring the radio broadcast that uh, still goes out. Here. Does anybody else have any other announcements that I might have missed or that you want to add this morning? Okay, I guess if not, we'll, we'll start out with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you this morning that we could be here, Lord, to fellowship with each other and to worship you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done. And we thank you for, for the rain that you sent this week. Uh, many people have been praying, Lord, and you always give us what, you need, what we need, and you're always so faithful to do that. And we're just thankful that, that we serve the true living God Lord, and that you are still in control, no matter what happens in this world, you are still in control, and we just thank you and praise you for that. Lord, we just ask that you would lead and guide this service this morning. We thank you for getting Paul here safely yesterday, and that, Lord, we could just see your, see your strength and power, Lord, as we worship you this morning in, in Thank you for that and honor you and glorify you uh, for what you are and what you've done for us in, in Christ. For those of us that are trusting in Jesus' finished work. So Lord, we just ask for your blessings on this service this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, it's time for scripture reading this morning. And... We'll be reading from Psalm 91, if you want to open up your Bibles. Psalm 91, I believe that's verses 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Doesn't that go well with a song that we just sang, right? God will take care of us. Please be seated. And we are going to call uh, for special music this morning. We'll call on Dad and Alan. This is a requested song that we're going to do, The Longer I Serve Him. And it's taken from Romans chapter 1 verse 9 it's when Paul is talking to the Romans it says I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son but it starts with the word God it, he's addressing it says God it says and so um, it's a song with benefits if you listen Sin 
Thanks, men, for that encouraging reminder. So we're going to take some time for uh, prayer requests this morning. Um, just got a couple of things. Um, I wanted to just, I guess, update everybody on the pastor search. Uh, we have had a couple, I'm going to say one candidate, that uh, a true candidate, and um, I was in correspondence with him, but it doesn't look like it's going to work out, so uh, just keep on praying. Um, so I would just say keep on praying for the pastor search, and uh, God knows what he's doing, even though we feel like we're maybe squirming here, and um, it, maybe it's not what we think it should be. God knows exactly what he's doing, so just keep praying for that. And uh, There has been a little bit of activity, but uh, nothing like I say that is going to um, provide a candidate for right now, I guess, and is the best I can come up with for wording. Um, I'm, I'm, I, as I look at you guys, I'm, I'm thankful that Richard and June are able to be with us. Um, you guys are an encouragement to me. You just keep coming to church with all the difficulties in your, uh, in your lives. Does, does anybody else have anybody that they want me to remember in prayer this morning? All right, well, let's take these things to the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning that we can come to you and ask for help. Everybody's got something that is plaguing them or that they're concerned about or a family member that's passed, that's passed on. Or, Lord, we, just, we need you so much, Lord. And 
you know, I guess that is the best spot to be in. If we need you, Lord Jesus, that means we're, we're going to be more faithful. We're going to storm the gates of heaven, and we're going to pray more, and we're going to read your word more. And, Lord, there's so many people that need so much, and we just, we just bring all these people to you this morning. Um, for Danny and uh, her, her dad passing, Lord, we just ask that you could comfort Derek and Danny and, and, and the family as they grieve the loss of Dewey. And also for, for Jen's family, the M family, as, as Grandpa Otto is uh, not long for this world, like, like is said so many times. And we just pray, Lord, for uh, Jen's family as, as they have, are forced to deal with Grandpa Otto's um, possible passing here in the future. Um, also for Charlene's cousin, Pam Grindle, as she's going through health challenges, Lord, we just ask that you, you could strengthen her. If she doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, we just ask that, or we pray that she could realize the need for Jesus and that Jesus does so much more than just taking the edge off of the broken glass. Jesus gives us what we need to to fight these these battles and and to face death knowing if we've tr if we're trusting in him and if we've given our if we've asked him to be our savior and realize that we're sinners and we've asked Jesus to save us that we have we have so much to look forward to and he can comfort us in in these times of need. Um, we also pray for Belva Parker with the infections that she's been struggling with. And thank you, Lord, for giving her a little relief on the foot. But also, Lord, we just ask that you could help her with these infections, Lord, that uh, you could give her body strength to fight it and that you could give whatever uh, doctor she's seeing the, the wisdom to, to find a way to treat her and help her. Uh, also, we, we pray for Ron and Lola and... Uh, and family and 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 James and now with with Lola and her not being able to use her arm anymore Lord she is such a picture of it it just seems like our struggles in this life some of us just we don't get a break and she just has to keep struggling with health problems but Lord we just pray for her and Ron and and James and Leanne and the whole family as they as they have to struggle through this time and all oh, that they would look to Jesus and, and I'm sure I'm sure Lola, Ron and Lola and family are doing so and we just pray that they would. I also, Lord, want to pray for Pastor and Mary and their health struggles. And there's so many of us that are struggling that might not have asked for prayer this morning in in our congregation, in our fellowship, uh, that need your not only healing power but because you are the great physician, but also we need your comfort in these times and strength from you. And also for Stephan and Marilyn and for Charles and for all the, all the ones that I'm forgetting, Lord, that I can never remember. Um, Lord, we just ask that you would, would help strengthen them and Lord, encourage them as they're going through these times and remind them that you're not only a prayer away, but your word is, we're still blessed enough in this country to have copies of your word everywhere so that we can read the Bible and be encouraged through our, through our trials and through our, through our pain. Also, Lord, we just want to lift up Paul this morning. He's been kind enough to come and, and give us the, feed us the word this morning, and we just want to pray for strength for him. Lord, that you've given him the right words to speak and the right scripture passages to feed us with this morning. Also, we want to pray for the, uh, the ministries that we support in our church. Uh, the Kenyan call, the, the Kenyan ministry with the people, those people in Africa are, are struggling with, with famine and sickness and disease and death. Lord, we just ask that you would strengthen each and every pastor of 
that is involved in the ministry, the Kenyan ministry, and, and the board members, and, and each and every, every believer that has come to Christ over there. We pray for them. Lord, we've got it so good so far in the United States of America, and we're thankful for that. We also want to pray for Trail Ridge in that ministry like Trent brought up. Lord, for all, all the kids, Lord, that they would want to listen to not only the counselors and, and the gospel speakers and the uh, Lord and Brother Aaron and uh, all the, the speakers that they have each week of camp, but also we pray for the cabin leaders and that they would want to share the gospel with these kids. And it sounds like they're doing a really good job of that. And we pray for the kids and we pray for safety for for these kids, especially coming into, coming into this week as well. And we thank you for, I guess, barring a couple injuries that I've heard about, but uh, Lord, you've, you've kept the, this camp ministry safe this summer, and we're thankful for that. And we just ask that you continue to bless Aaron and all the staff for strength. Also for the VCY radio ministry that we all enjoy, Lord, uh, for Jim and so many other of the staff members, that you'd strengthen them. Pacific Garden Mission, Lord, and I'm sure there's other ministries that I'm forgetting about, Lord, but uh, for Pastor Phil down in Chicago, and Lord, with this hot summer that we're having, I'm, I know they're overloaded like they always are. We just pray that they would continue to share the gospel as well as physical needs for these people. And for Friends of Israel, the gospel ministry, Lord, and and. Paul that's with us this morning and Lord that you would strengthen and encourage every member and every outlet of that ministry that there are so many that are reaching all points of this world and we're thankful for that ministry Lord Jesus as they uh, not only minister to the Jewish people but also to anybody that will listen uh, that, that needs to hear the gospel and needs to have Jesus as their Savior needs to invite Jesus to be their Savior and also, Lord, for the, for the nation of Israel, Lord, as, as we're seeing the escalation, it seems like there's always escalation of violence and, and threats to the, the apple of your eye, uh, Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. We just ask that you would protect and strengthen uh, them right now in these days. Lord, we just ask, too, that you'd bless the offering that we're about ready to receive and bless the rest of the service. Also, Lord, I forgot to pray for the radio ministry uh, that goes out every morning at 930. Lord, we just pray that we know that it encourages so many people that faithfully listen and they love the, they love the preaching. And we're, we're so thankful that you gave Pastor Grevin the, uh, the insight to start that so many years ago. And we just pray for it as it goes out every Sunday, Lord, to to bring it to someone's ears that might need to hear it and that is not saved and that, that might need or that needs to be saved. We just pray for blessings for that, Lord. Lord, please bless the rest of our service this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's great to be back with you today. If you're a guest here, let me introduce myself. I'm Paul Scharf, a Church Ministries representative with the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry. And it's wonderful to be uh, back with you here today at Bad Axe for uh, this week and next again. We're going to continue what we started last month to look into the book of 2 Corinthians. I know some of you are extremely disappointed that my wife is not here today uh, and not uh, providing music like she usually does, but... Uh, She's purposely staying back this week and next. Nothing against you. We're sorry about that. But she's getting some rest at my direction uh, before our next trip. So uh, we, uh, we're sorry that she's not here, but she's with you in spirit. Sends her greetings, and it's great to be back with you. And let me just say a word about what we have coming up. Uh, so you're aware and can pray for us and feel invited as well. And I do have some literature items that are all free for you to take on the back ledge. And uh, they describe some of these things as well. We're getting ready to go. It's now just at the end of next week, hard to believe. 
uh, back to Indiana to uh, Winona Lake, Indiana, Grace College at the end of next week, Friday and Saturday, for the Proclaim Conference, our national Bible conference, one of three that we have this year for the Friends of Israel, but I'm privileged to speak at this one in Winona Lake. We'd love to have you there if you're still thinking about a last-minute vacation and can make it to uh, Winona Lake, Indiana next week, July 28 and 29. And if not, please pray for us. But that's described on the back of Israel My Glory, our magazine. I have two different editions for you to take there on the, in the back. And also, by the way, a sign-up sheet if you'd like to receive a free subscription to Israel My Glory and stay in touch with the Friends of Israel, especially if you'd like to stay in touch with our ministry, I invite you to provide your email, and we will gladly put you on our email list if you uh, give your consent for that, and that is the very best way you can stay up with all the news about our ministry, and we'd love to have you there. Uh, something else you'd find out about if you do that is coming up in August, and this is one you don't have to go anywhere for. It's online and also free like the Winona Lake Conference. I'll be teaching for the first time in our FOI Equip classes, and those are generally on Thursday evenings online on Zoom, and people around the country, around the world gather together, and I'm going to be speaking on August 10 and 17 two weeks on a subject, Patriarchs and Presidents, How America Has Blessed Israel. And we invite you to participate and tune in for that as well. And you can find all of that information uh, on our website, foi.org. And you can find uh, much more direction again on the back ledge. And then let me invite you to one other event. This one uh, will also involve you going away, but not as far as Winona Lake. If you'd like to consider uh, coming to Wausau, Wisconsin on November 18th, the Saturday before Thanksgiving, we're going to have a Prophecy Up Close event, Friends of Israel Prophecy Up Close event regarding the temple at Wausau Bible Church, Wausau, Wisconsin, November 18th of this year. So please feel welcome to all of those, and uh, please feel welcome to take the materials in the back. And again, please pray for our ministry in the meantime and for these things if you cannot be part of them as we pray for you. Well, again, it's great to be back with you today for this time and to look into God's Word and to return to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 today. Well, actually, we're going to back up where we left off in chapter 4 for just a moment. In 2 Corinthians 4, we know that the, the controlling theme there is we do not lose hope. Remember, the really the controlling idea of the whole book is found in chapter 1, verse 8 uh, and verse 9, that we should not trust in ourselves, when Paul said we despaired even of life, but we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead. And in chapter 4, Paul is fleshing that out in terms of his ministry and principles of living and serving by grace in this age of grace. And he says, we do not lose heart. He says it in verse 1. And he says it again in verse 16. And you may remember that there's a moral component to that statement in the original text. It's not simply, we don't give up. <clears throat> but it's that we refuse to cave in to the evil of losing heart, of despairing. Someone said that despair is a greater sin than any of the sins that led up to the feeling of despair. We do not lose heart. We do not give in to the temptation to commit the evil of losing faith in the Lord God, trust in the Lord God, to continue to follow him. Paul says, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Now notice, Paul is going to build on this theme in the verses that we're going to follow through this morning. 
He says, our light affliction. We talked about that last time. Maybe you've come here today with a light affliction or two in your life. And you say, what are you talking about, light affliction? You wait till you hear the problems I have. Well, Paul is going to build a comparison. I don't discount the importance, the significance of your afflictions, but Paul is building a comparison that we're going to see. Light compared to what? Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it's, it's light and temporary, and it's actually, in the meantime, we might, w- we might wish it would last a few more moments because it's actually working for us. God is working all things together for those who love him, and he's working through our afflictions, we're going to see, to increase our capacity to reflect his glory in eternity. We're thinking today about the earthly and the eternal. It's working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen. Well, of course, we all look at the things which are seen all the time, right? What's Paul saying? Well, is that where you, is that the, na- the, the focus of your concern, those things that you see? In other words, if you only look at the things that you see, if we look all around us at the things we can see, whether we would take the far view and think of events in our nation, in our world, whether we would take a much closer view and just think of things immediately around us in our personal lives, in any of those cases, we would look at the things we can see and we, if we look long enough, and probably not very long, we would be utterly hopeless, wouldn't we? We would be filled with fear and anxiety and, yes, the temptation to despair. Paul says we, uh, we don't look at the things which are seen in terms of our focus of our life. Obviously, we, we want to look and be aware of what's going on around us, but it's not our focus. It's not the place that we put our confidence word that he's going to use in the next chapter we do not look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen well how in the world are you going to paul look at the things which are not seen well if you're going to look at the things which are not seen obviously you're going to have to have some kind of ability beyond the natural you're going to in other words paul is talking about a way of interpreting life that accounts for the things that are not seen. How are we going to do that? We're going to have to interpret all the things that are seen in light of God's holy word that gives us the key to interpreting all of life, taking into account the all-important things that are not seen. Ah, so that the things that are seen then fall into proper perspective. We don't look at the things which are seen We don't focus on them. We look with the eyes of faith beyond them to the things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Remember what Jim Elliott said, who was martyred by the Aka Indians as a missionary. He said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That is eternally true, is it not? Paul is going to go in verse 1, and he's going to build on this very theme that we have seen here at the end of chapter 4. Chapter 5, verse 1, he says, We know something. We know something. Now this is one of those things that we know not by looking around at things that are seen. We can only know it. We can only understand it. We can only evaluate it through the lens of God's eternal word. It's one of these unseen things. But we believe it is true on the basis of the word of God. We know this. We know that if our earthly house, now he's talking about a house, now, this careful here, this is an image that Paul is using, a metaphor. 
that actually, because it, it's a little bit tricky here, there's actually several views of what Paul is talking about. I think it becomes rather plain, rather evident. Actually, I'll just tell you the end of the story. What I think Paul is talking about is he's talking about our human body as a house. Or literally in this life, he's going to call it a tent. And he's going to compare that to the house that we're going to receive for our spirit, our soul. It's going to have a, rev a revived house, a resurrected house in heaven. Now, I don't think Paul is talking about the mansions that Jesus is building for us. True as that is, Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. He's building a house for us in heaven. He's building a mansion in the Father's house, right? I don't think that's what Paul is talking about here although that is absolutely true as well and very much something we should focus on and understand. But I think here he's talking about a house as an analogy, a metaphor for our human body. He says, we know that if our earthly house, he's been talking about our body breaking down. He's been talking about the light afflictions that trouble us. <coughs> they, we know that our outward man is perishing through these things. And he says, we know that if our earthly house, this tent, he calls it a tent that's going to be destroyed. You know, Peter talks this way as well in 2 Peter 1, 13 and 14. I'll just read it to you quickly. He compares our life here to living in a tent. He says, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, 2 Peter 1, 13 and 14, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Well, Paul knew all about tents, didn't he? He was a tent maker. That's how he earned his, his much of his income. And a tent is what? A tent is temporary. A, a tent is as Paul's going to describe it here, light. It's very much fleeting compared with something much more permanent. Remember the children of Israel, when they first came into the land before they were completely established and settled, they worshiped God in a tent, didn't they? In a tabernacle. And then one day God allowed King Solomon to build something much more significant, much more substantial, much more glorious. And they moved into their temple. And that's, again, a comparison that Paul is making here. The light, the temporary versus the weighty and the eternal. We know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For he says, in this we groan. How many can relate to that when you got out of bed this morning? In this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. There's going to be a day, Paul says, when our earthly house having been destroyed, God's going to put a brand new house around our soul or spirit. In, in other words, we're going to have an, a body suited for eternity. We're going to have a new resurrection body. If indeed having been f uh, clothed, verse 3, we shall not be found naked. So you see there, he's talking about the body. Again, not a mansion that God is building for us, true as that is, certainly is. He's talking about our physical bodies, how our bodies are going to be restored, renewed, resurrected one day, suited for all eternity. Verse 4, for we who are in this tent groan, he says, not uh, be, in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. When this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with heaven, uh, with hands, eternal in the heavens. 
we, we have something that is eternal. We have something that is weighty. We have something that as opposed to this light tent in which we live now of our body, we have something far more significant, far more impressive. You know, when you think of the light versus the weighty, the light, the, the fleeting, the temporary versus the eternal. You think of something significant. What, what do you think of in terms of a building? Maybe a, a giant uh, timber frame building. And I was in, I believe, the, the largest timber frame building in the world, if I understand correctly, just a couple of weeks ago, the Ark Encounter in Williamstown, Kentucky. I hope you all get to see the Ark. It's massive. It's incredible. It's, it's huge. It's weighty. The beams, all the woodwork, that, all the in, incredible workmanship that went into that, it's, it's impressive. That's something that we could look at and we could say, that's weighty, that is significant. That isn't light. The, the, the body that we have now, it's light, it's fleeting, it's temporary, it's, it's going to be destroyed, it's going to be dissolved. But the eternal house that God will place on us for eternity, it's weighty, it's impressive, it's significant. It's a masterpiece of his work. He says in verse 4 again, We who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. Notice this phrase then, Ah, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now does that ring any bells with you? Does that remind you of something just a few pages to the left in your Bible? In 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. Sounds like something very similar, doesn't it? Mortality is swallowed up in life. Now let's go back up in 1 Corinthians 15, which is the resurrection chapter, and into this very section where Paul is talking about the very exchange, the very plan that God has for our resurrected body and he describes it in greater detail than he does even in 2 Corinthians 5. And we'll pick up in verse 42. And he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead. We stood and confessed our faith this morning that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the body. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, your body will be resurrected to be in heaven for all eternity with Christ. It will be made new in this significant way that uh, we've begun to understand here that Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 5. In fact, our resurrection bodies, and this could be a whole other message, will be patterned after Jesus' resurrection body. And we'll talk about that a little more if we have time. But look with me here in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 again. The resurrection of the dead. You know, there are some advantages to being in a, in a church location such as you are here with a cemetery right here. Uh, for one, you obviously know some of these people. Some of them are very dear to you. Some of them may be your relative, your loved one, who has gone on to be with the Lord. And as you drive into the church house each week you see that cemetery and uh, well you get to see their grave at least from a distance on that particular morning but you know all of us look at those graves and we see the legacy of people who've gone before us who've lived lives of faith a cloud of witnesses who urge us to continue on but we also see something else that's lost in much of our culture that is the reality of life and of death we try to push death out of our out of our common daily understanding and existence in our culture today we don't most most people that is unless uh, you know unless you're 
uh, in, a, in a role such as agriculture is one that's left that deals with life and death all the time. But many people, they want to cleanse themselves from any thought of life, or especially of death, the significance of life and death, any reminders of death. You see the reminders of death each week as you drive here into church. And that's going to serve as another helpful illustration for something in the future that we'll talk about next week. But Paul says the body is sown in corruption. As we have a funeral service, a memorial service, a celebration of life, as it's often called today, whatever you want to call it, for a person who has died, who has passed away, who has gone to be with the Lord. Let's think about the death of the Christian here, first and foremost. We stand there at the open graveside, and the body is sown in the ground like a seed. That's the analogy Paul is making here. It's sown in corruption. Remember what Paul had said in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 4. Mortality is one day going to be swallowed up in life, but right now it's mortal, it's dead. It's, so, it's sown in, in corruption, but one day it'll be raised in incorruption. Mortality will be swallowed up in life. It's sown in dishonor. As you have the casket at the front of the church, you take the casket out to the cemetery, out to the open grave. What could be more dishonoring? Now, not that we're trying to dishonor, we're trying to honor the legacy of the person, but what could be, what could be more dishonorable? What could be weaker, Paul says, it's sown in weakness, than to be there to see the person's lifeless body. It's corrupt, it's weak, it's powerless, it's in a state of dishonor in that sense. But that body that we see lying in that state, it's going to be, for the believer, it's going to be raised in incorruption. It's going to be raised in glory. It's going to be raised in power. It's going to be like the comparison of a tent which, I don't know about you, I don't aspire to live in a tent. That would be very difficult, wouldn't it? Most people, if we, live, if we use a tent, it's for a sort of an adventure for a very short term. And that tent is subject to every possible danger out under the forces of nature, and it's only for a short time. It's like comparing a tent with the temple, with a palace if you will, with the Ark Encounter. It's like comparing this, this flawed, uh, flimsy, failing little tent with a magnificent timber frame building that's almost indestructible. But this body will be actually indestructible. It will be raised in power. Paul says it is sown a natural body. And the word natural there is literally the word soulish. Soulish. We believe we have a soul and a spirit. The, the Bible doesn't really distinguish in a way that we can understand at least the difference between our soul and our spirit. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God can cut all the way to the point where there's any division between soul and spirit. It's a difference really in how they function. Our Natural bodies are made to function with our souls, and we're somewhat limited through the, through, in our natural body, which sort of fits around our soul, and it seems to be a limitation from us in that state from really knowing and understanding, experiencing the power of God. But our new body will be a spiritual body. Does that mean it'll be composed of spirit? No, it'll be fitted for the use of our spirit. And in our spirits, through our redeemed bodies, we will know God in a brand new and completely different way. There is a natural body, Paul says, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Who's the last Adam? 
Well, the first Adam is our first father. We received our natural physical life going back to him. The last Adam, the second Adam from above, who is that congregation? It's Jesus Christ, that's right. The second Adam, the last Adam, who has come to give us spiritual life, eternal life. He's a life-giving spirit. Let me pause here and say that Jesus Christ is eternal God who became also man. He took upon himself, can you believe this, a natural body and lived in this world, even a body that could succumb to death. He died on the cross in our place for our sins so we could have the forgiveness of sin and eternal life in heaven with him. If we'll trust in him alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, we believe on him and the Lord God by grace alone gives us these free gifts of forgiveness of sin and eternal life. If we're trusting in him alone and nothing that we can do. And Paul says that the spiritual body is not first but the natural, verse 46. And afterward, the spiritual. The first man, Adam, was of the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Have you trusted in him, Jesus Christ, the Lord from heaven, who is going to remake us in his image in terms of an eternal body, a, a body suited for all eternity in heaven, a resurrected body. Now going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has also given us the spirit as a guarantee. Now if you're paying close attention, You'll know that you've, we've seen that before in 2 Corinthians 1.22, a common idea that is, that the believer is sealed with the Holy Spirit. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. In other words, we have some type of spiritual seal placed upon us when we believe in Jesus Christ so that by the power of the Holy Spirit... God is superintending over our lives, yes, over our bodies. Ephesians 1.13 and 4.30 talk about this idea as well. The Holy Spirit has some control over our lives, over our bodies, and even when the believer dies, the Holy Spirit has a relation to that believer's body body even as it's sown in the ground like a seed that will one day be harvested as something much greater he's in control we talk about those who have uh, died for instance in war the dead at sea or those whose death is so horrible that their body cannot even be be uh, captured to to be placed in a coffin but if that person's a believer God the Holy Spirit knows all about all the makeup of that body. It, his seal is still upon it in such a way it will be resurrected. There's no doubt about that. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And now notice, and we're going to close here in a moment, but please stay with me as we consider these very important points that Paul talks about as we do so. He says in verse 6, So we are always confident. He's going to use forms of that word four times through the rest of this book. Once right here in verse 6 and again in verse 8. Remember our theme in 2 Corinthians, we're trusting in God. We refuse to cave into the sin of despairing, of losing heart. We're confident. We have a confidence because of all this. Our afflictions, in light of eternity, our afflictions are very light. They're very much fleeting. They're only momentary. We wish they could last longer. We wish we could endure longer. Because 
as we suffer them, God is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He's increasing our capacity to reflect his glory in eternity. So we're confident. We have this new confidence now. We are always confident. Paul says, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Well, that doesn't sound like something that should make us confident, does it? Well, we're we're absent from the Lord. Well, while we're here in our body, we're absent from the Lord. What are we to be doing in the meantime with our confidence? Are we waiting for God to drop a some new revelation, some tablet down on our head, or speak to us in an audible voice? No, no, no. That's not how we, where we get our confidence. Remember, we're looking at things that aren't seen, but we can know things that aren't seen on the basis of the authority of God's word. We can be confident. We can know even this, that while we're at home in the body, yes, absent from the Lord, what are we to be doing? We walk by faith not by sight. We walk by faith. We live our lives on the basis of our confidence, our trust in the authority of the promises, the commands, the precepts of God's word. We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by the, we implement the principles of living by grace that Paul is teaching us here in 2 Corinthians. We walk by faith not by sight. And so he says, also we can be confident of this. Yes, well pleased, he says, verse 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. This is what Paul is talking about in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 21. For me to live is Christ, To die is gain. Remember there was a time, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he despaired even of life. That's not what he's saying here. Uh, Don't ever misinterpret Paul's words to say there's an excuse to succumb to the temptation to take your own life and depart this life before God wills for you to end your service. He is sovereign over all the affairs of life and death. Uh, It's never acceptable for anyone, especially for the Christian, to take his or her own life. He's not saying, well, to die is gain, so I'm ready to go right now. No, I'm going to go on and continue, Paul says in Philippians, uh, as long as uh, I live on, that's going to mean fruit from my labor. Greater increase of the capacity to reflect the glory of God in eternity. In fact, uh, to be with Christ, he says, Philippians 1.23 is better. But for me to be here serving the churches, well, that's, that's better for you. So Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 5.8, as we do this, so as we leave our lives in God's hands, as we live out our natural life under the will of God, Say, Lord God, whatever years you would have for me to live, whatever days you have, let me live them for your glory. We live them with confidence that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Absent from the body means to be immediately, I would say in the next second, but that's too long. In the presence of the Lord. That's the, that's the, I mean, how do you harm a Christian who has that hope? What's the worst thing that can happen? Well, I will die of something. Oh, but that means that before I even know what happens, I will be with the Lord. Now notice, you won't have that new eternal body yet in that moment, because we're going to talk about that next week and how that happens. There's an intermediate time in which you'll be in heaven with the Lord without your body. Your body is yet to be resurrected. We'll talk about that next week. We're going to talk about the rapture of the church. I hope you'll all be back with us then. And I'm going to use the cemetery again as the illustration of all that. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we got to witness that while we were here talking about it? 
Wouldn't it be wonderful if that we got to witness that uh, before next week and we weren't even together next week here on earth, but we were together with the Lord? Well, Paul says, We're confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I love the story uh, Dr. Woodrow Kroll told about being on an airplane once and there was, I think, an engine had gone out, some significant problem, not just a run-of-the-mill issue with his flight. And they had announced this, and we're keeping everyone posted. And someone noticed that he was very, very calm in the midst of all this. And one woman was frantic, and she said, How can you be so calm when all of us could die in this airplane? And he said, Dear lady, it's, it's very simple. This plane goes down. I'm going up. Absent from the body present with the Lord. God spared Dr. Kroll's life, of course, to serve him till this very day. But Paul says we make it our aim, whether present or absent, we're going to use the time that we have to be well-pleasing in his sight, knowing we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I feel like I've opened up all kinds of doors and subjects we could talk about for hours upon end here. The resurrection body, the resurrection body of Jesus, which our body will be like, which we have not gotten back to. And Paul now says, the judgment seat of Christ, where believers only, church age believers only, will stand before Christ. It will be the event following the rapture that we'll talk about next week. And we will give an account for our lives. But in one sense, he's wrapping up something that you remember he started above, which we touched on, is that our afflictions are working for us the ability to reflect the glory of God in eternity. He's working something that's much more weighty, that's much more important, that's much more impactful than these little light afflictions we have. And that is the issue of how much we'll be able to reflect the glory of God in eternity, and that will be determined at the judgment seat of Christ. So don't waste your time in this natural body despairing of life or or being caught up in just the things you can see or being concerned about these light afflictions which are but, but for a moment. But focus like a laser on the judgment seat of Christ where we'll stand before Christ in our resurrection bodies. You'll have that. Don't worry about that. Use all the time you have now living with confidence to be ready to stand before Jesus Christ. We have to end. There's so much more, again, that could be said. But I would just want to share again the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. If you've placed your trust in him alone then you'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. You'll have a resurrection body. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ? Have you received the gift? Be sure that you are trusting in him alone. His blood shed on the cross of Calvary. He died in our place for our sins. He was buried and he rose again, opening the way to the new life that we're talking about today. And at any moment, he may return and grant us our resurrection bodies in an instant. In fact, if you could watch a slow motion, you could see how he'll even do that for those who have died and gone on before us, whose bodies are buried in weakness, but they'll be raised in power. We'll talk about that next week. May God bless you as you serve him with confidence in the days between now and now. And then, and let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can live not in despair. Yes, we're concerned about the things that we can see, but we want to look beyond them. We want to have understanding of things we cannot see, interpreting life on the basis of your word and exercising confidence as we then serve you, Lord, in this meantime, in the time you give us in this life, so that we can be better prepared 
to stand before you at the judgment seat of Christ where we'll, Lord, our eternity will not be in, ju- in doubt there, but our service to you will be rewarded. Amen. Well, thank you, Paul, for that encouraging message. So for the closing hymn today, uh, if you would all stand as we sing and open up to hymn number 304, For You I Am Praying. with prayer. Lord, we thank you for being able to be in fellowship together this morning, and we thank you for Paul's message about your blessed hope and the encouragement that we have as believers of what the future holds, even though, like we've discussed also this morning, life is, can be very difficult, but we, we have that joy of salvation knowing that we're going to be at home with you someday and because of what Jesus has done and we're trusting in him. So Lord, we just ask for strength as we face this week and that we would go out and live our lives for you 
like it said and like we just read, it, that our lives would be pleasing to you. Lord, help us to leave with that attitude and with that goal in mind to serve you this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, receive the benediction today. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.